We'll get started in a couple minutes. Tom is online. We uh, resolved the issues from last week, so thank you for your patience. We'll uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes here for people to log in, and then we'll we'll get started. So. And if you want to uh, mute your microphones, uh, they'll, they'll be, as we do the presentation, Tom said he's comfortable with questions as you have them, you can unmute, but just to minimize background noise, uh, we'll all mute our microphones. And um, if you want to turn off your video, you can, you can do that as well. So we will be recording this, so we'll have it available, so. All right. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not muted. Okay. When he starts, I'll put it to this screen so it's bigger. Yeah, I'm glad it's working. No. Okay, well, we are going to get started. Um, again, uh, if, if you would, uh, Tom will mention this, but he is comfortable with questions as you have them. So you, uh, you can unmute, obviously, to ask. But while Tom's speaking, uh, if we just keep our mics on mute, and if you don't need your video on, um, you can you can turn off the video just to save some bandwidth here. But uh, so I wanna to introduce Tom and then we'll get started. Uh, and the other thing is the way we have this set up, if you look at the uh, upper right, there should be view options for you guys. If you click view on speaker, and then once we get started, uh, Tom's picture will be the, the thing that shows up largest. So you can see his, his works and studio and that. Um, and we have it set so even if you ask questions, it'll still be just him that shows up on the screen. So with that, uh, Tom Voice is a British painter um, whose subject matter comprises a variety of different themes such as interiors and semi-abstracted landscapes, often within the notion of place and transit. The artworks consistently demonstrate an interest in the formal elements of composition, being structure, perspective, shape, and light. The strength of these pieces lies not in their faithful depiction of landscape, but in their suggestion of a sense of place or being present within a particular space at a particular moment. In 2017, Tom participated on Sky Arts Landscape Artist of the Year, where his powerful and distinctive landscapes thrilled the judges and he went on, again, if people could mute their mic, <laughs> thrilled judges and he went on to win the competition and was given the opportunity to paint a view from the legendary playwright Noel Coward's home in Jamaica. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and without further ado, Tom Voice. After a week's delay, it's Tom Voice. Hello, hello everyone. <laughs> Hi, right, nice, nice to meet you all. Um, I'm, I, again, at first I'd like to start off by apologising for whatever happened last week, uh, but I'm thrilled to be with you all now, and um, it's really, really, really good to see you all. Well, kind of, I can't see anyone other than myself, but you get the idea. Um, it's great to talk to you all about... Uh... Did anyone get that? <laughs> oh, somehow, yeah, somehow you got muted there. Sorry. Okay, no, it's cool. Um, I'll, I'll start again, shall I? Oh. Yeah, so um, <laughs> first of all, thank you for all for having me. <laughs> um, and I, I'm really ple pleased to be talking to you today uh, from surprisingly a sunny UK. It's, it's sort of 20 degrees here, which I don't know what that is in the US, but it's a really nice day here. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be in my studio today to talk to you all and to show you how, about my practice and about how I work and talk to you a little bit about where I've come from as an artist and um and like I said if you've got any questions 
please do ask, uh, stop and ask uh, at any point. If not, I can go back and we can have a chat at the end and you can ask any questions at the end. That's absolutely fine. Um, I really want to sort of give you a show of, of my studio and I'm kind of really lucky that I've, I've got an adjacent sort of space that I've sort of inherited and moved into as well. And um, I've also got a gallery space downstairs that I'm currently setting up for a show um, that's due to open in a few weeks. So I'll give you a good, uh, it'll give you a good example of how I work and, and sort of um, the mess that I've made in this studio. So I'll warn you, it's not neat, it's not tidy, it is a mess, but um, I think we're all artists, aren't we? And we all understand that that's how we work. Um, but yeah, first, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for the League of Milwaukee Artists for having me, uh, especially to, to Bob for putting this together today. I know we've had a few issues, but it's really good to sort of get it working and hopefully uh, have a good chat to you all. And, and thank you to May for uh, getting in touch with me in the first place on Instagram and um, sort of starting the ball rolling with all of these cool things. And hopefully I'll get to see a lot of you more, a lot more of you uh, in July when I come over, hopefully to the US. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but this will hopefully give you an idea of where I, what I'm about and, and uh, where, I'm, where I've come from. So as mentioned, my name's Tom. Uh, I'm a 32, soon to be 33, makes me feel old, uh, here old artists. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a painter, uh, but I, I trained in printmaking and drawing and painting. So I've, got, I've done lots of different sort of uh, technical skills uh, through art school, um, but I've kind of always loved painting and drawing. So that was always the thing that I was going to sort of follow and try and pursue. Um, and my work is mostly sort of uh, about landscape, um, urban, rural, um, in, in a sort of semi-abstracted way. And one thing I'm really interested in is trying to explore the boundary between uh, abstraction and figurative work and the kind of and how that kind of forms together and, and what, what sort of blurred lines might occur from either or. Um, I also look at interiors, still life. Um, a lot of the time that is mainly because I've kind of got a bit fed up of doing landscape and I kind of like to try and do something else, especially in lockdown, actually, when I was in the studio quite a lot, which was great. Um, but it, I wasn't able to get out and about and do a huge amount of landscape drawing as much as I'd have liked. So a lot of that was sort of setting up small still lives uh, as well. Um, I also really like doing life drawing. Um, I'm lucky that while I work, I teach life drawing. Uh, and alongside another colleague of mine, we kind of switched teaching. So we get to do a lot of that every week. And for me, like drawing is fundamental to the way I work. Um, and it's, it's something that I feel is really important to keep doing especially life drawing as well it's like almost like a, a sort of a training to your kind of to the to gives you all of the skills you need uh, the fundamental skills you need to kind of do your own practice so they're the things I kind of love to do um, and I'll show you some examples in a moment of sketchbooks and things that I've got kind of dotted around um, and other artists kind of books and things um, but but my experience mainly um, and my kind of art sort of experiences come from looking at actually American art and, and especially sort of mid 20th century kind of painting um, and sort of certainly sort of um, abstract uh, realism. Uh, the work of sort of Edward Hopper, for example, who I was obsessed with at university. Um, I, I, there was something about them that were incredibly powerful um, and especially the ones that were void of people, um, which if you've seen any of my work, you'll see that that's a kind of recurring theme is that I don't have people in them. And often people say, well, why, why can't you put a little duck in there or a little per, it, it doesn't work. Um, it's not that I'm a serial killer or some kind of weird person that doesn't like people in my work. It's just, I don't think that they add anything to them. This kind of abstracted element of a landscape. I'm more interested in the kind of, the, the way that fits together and, and the fact that people aren't in them. There's nothing more to it. It's not, there's not some kind of deep meaning. It just, it's, it's the way they tend to work. Um, and I think a lot of that did come from looking at Edward Hopper um, and especially sort of some of his more, uh, some of his works that I'll show you in, in a moment. Um, and that kind of cinematic realism for me was really powerful. And I was really interested in how his paintings worked. And I did, I obsessed by kind of trying to make versions of them and, and trying to depict them in, in from what I could see around me. Uh, the, the problem I've got is that in the UK, you don't tend to get the quality of light that you tend to get in the US, uh, especially sort of the further uh, to the sort of West Coast that you go, which um, which you don't really get too much here. You do now and again. And when you do, I, I would be running outside with a sketchbook trying to draw things and take photos of stuff to, as well whilst, whilst I could try and capture that light. Because for me, it's something that was so powerful about the quality of light in Hopper's work as well. Um, and that's what essentially drew me to the work of Richard Devoncorn and, and sort of the Bay Area, Bay Area artists. Um, through one of my tutors who was obsessed by him. Um, so she gave me loads of books and said, you need to look at this guy. Um, and I, I changed my obsession from Hopper to, to Devoncorn and I kind of 
focused on him and trying to sort of figure out how I could depict my own sort of style through looking through what he does and kind of try and find my own footpath through all of those sorts of things. So he was what I look, ended up going on to then. And then I ended up uh, going to the Debunker retrospective at the Royal Academy in London, which was life changing for me. I can't remember when it was. I think it was 2013 or something like that, 12. Um, and that was an amazing experience. And seeing my favourite painting, uh, Cityscape One, which is this one here, which I think you can see, just this one here, um, in, in real life was amazing. <laughs> um, and so seeing how that, that, that kind of combined lots of really interesting things for me, such as these kind of wonderful shadows, these kind of amazing shapes and this perspective, all of those things combined to make this kind of wonderful painting that I, I was really interested in. And I was trying to think, how can I depict, how can I gather and, and, and sort of collect these, these amazing things in this amazing painterly way, while still retaining those kind of abstracted sharp edges and things. So I was always trying to kind of figure my way through all of this. Um, and that was mostly at sort of art school. So that was sort of what, 10 years ago now. Um, and I went to art school in, um, in Wales, which is, if anyone knows much of the UK, it's a separate country to England. Um, and it was West Wales, um, where it was on the sort of west coast of the country. And it was a small little art school. Um, and I was really keen to go there purely because it sort of specialised in drawing and painting and a little bit of printmaking as well. So I wasn't really into sort of very contemporary kind of art practice where you kind of sit in a room and talk about things and and stuff like that and, and run around naked and stuff like that. I wasn't interested in going to a lot of art schools that a lot of my peers did in, in London. Um, I wanted to kind of learn my, my sort of practice of painting and drawing. Um, so there was a lot of live drawing. There was a lot of drawing, uh, uh, measured drawing, we called it, which was sort of perspective and learning how to sort of depict depth, which I think have all had a massive impact on me in hindsight. Um, and so I was really interested in sort of learning about those things. And I had some really amazing teachers that, that led me into sort of artists such as what, what those that we've mentioned. And, and yeah, so I, I kind of really became obsessed by that. And I did three years there, uh, learned a lot about myself and about my practice, but I didn't feel like I did enough. Um, and I felt like there was more to come. And I was really lucky that I got offered a job in the, in the, in the, in the art school to uh, do a little bit of teaching whilst also doing a master's. Uh, over two years so um, I was really lucky that I got essentially got paid to do that um, and I had my own studio space that I lived in pretty much um, and that's when I really started to explore um, a lot of the work that I was really interested in especially those to do with sort of travel and journeys and transit um, and I, I did a little little trip through Europe uh, an interrail trip where you get a sort of rail pass and you kind of travel from place to place and sort of sleep in hostels and things. And I did that and I kind of drew and filled sketchbooks full of it, full of drawings. Um, and that really formed the basis to my master's show, which, which uh, was mostly to do with sort of small paintings on board. Um, and there's a lot I'm not describing, but I'm trying to kind of give you an overview of how I kind of came to where I am now, because I was kind of really interested in working on, in, on a small scale. Um, and I'll show you a kind of example of the sort of boards that I work on. That's actually, at the time, that was probably actually quite big for me um, because I was working in this small studio. I had no money and I was basically using offcuts of, of MDF wood to pe paint on. Um, and the reason why I wanted to sort of use sort of cheaper materials was because I quite like the firmness of wood. I feel canvas, it takes, canvas is like a very precious thing. It, it takes a lot of time to stretch it and make it look really nice where this was quite quick and in, in, you could be quite impulsive with how you work on it. Um, and I like the hard surface. So for me, I could get lots of these little pieces of boards and make these quick sort of painting thumbnail studies that essentially came from my drawings. And I'll show you a couple of drawings here. This is an example of um, one of the sketchbook pages that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, and if anyone, like I said, if anyone wants to look more at them, uh, please do tell me and I'll sort of stop. But I kind of work on sort of thumbnail sketches. So these are kind of compositions of places um, that kind of form the basis to my paintings. Um, so I hope you can see them. Yeah, so these, these are, this is kind of really important to the way I work. So I will sit and do drawings like this, hopefully on location. Um, and then I'll bring them back to the studio and these will form the basis to my studies on board. Um, and then what I tend to do, like I said, is work on sort of studies at this scale. And at the time I was, I was kind of, the intention was to go big. Like you feel like I think as a painter sometimes, especially when you speak to art galleries, 
that New York work needs to be big. Um, and especially when you see the work of Demon Corn and in places like the Royal Academy, when you go and see these wonderful exhibitions, is that the work is big. You don't tend to have paintings this size uh, more often than not. So there was this pressure to kind of go big, but I kind of, there was something about them working at that scale. They kind of had this energy and this kind of impulsiveness about them. And, and there, was, there was something really powerful with them. And especially I think when I was exhibiting them, they drew people in. And people were really kind of interested in what what they contained in this small space. Um, and also, I think the way I work tend to lend itself to that size. I mean, the bushes I kind of tend to work on are sort of these sort of filbert bushes here. Um, and I also use my painting wedge, which a lot of people, if they've seen the program, kind of constantly email me about. Um, this was something one of my friends bought me at uh, an art uh, an art um, shop, and I kind of use these to move around stuff on the boards. And because the board's firm, it allows lots of nice shapes and things to happen. Um, but, and I use oil paint as well because acrylic dries too quickly. Um, I'm giving you a bit of a rundown of how I work in terms of technical aspects. I won't go too in depth, but I just think stuff like this has essentially changed my practice. It means I'm less, it's, it's hard to describe. I don't want to be too obsessed and too obsessive with a painting with detail because I feel like it would be too figurative and it will lack that kind of energy. Um, so for me, it was do stuff quickly, do stuff with the minimum amount of marks as possible and keep it almost like a sketch. Um, and that's what I tried to do. And so working on that scale, I kind of constantly, and it never kind of, they never became bigger. <laughs> uh, so I kind of constantly worked at that scale. And then, and then actually in 2017, I had a bit of a, a break um, where I was training to be a teacher, an art teacher. I worked at an art school after uh, university which was great while I kept painting. And I, I was emailed by someone to, uh, who'd been on Landscape Artist of the Year, which is a sort of program that I believe you get on some channels in the US. Um, but here it's ran by Sky, who I think are a Fox, the same company who are Fox. And, um, and, they, and she said to me, she said, oh, I, I was on this uh, program last year. I did really well, I got to the final. Um, she said, I think you should do it. And I was quite busy trying to, trying to be a teacher at the time. So I was quite busy. And, and I thought, well, what the hell, I'll have a go and see what happens. And fortunately, I got on. Um, and basically, the way it works is that you go to a location and you compete against, in the first round, seven other people. And you're in these pod things that protect you from the elements, which fortunately for, for me was very useful in the first round because it tipped it down the whole time. Um, but fortunately for me, I made a painting that the judges really liked. Um, and another thing that I didn't actually mention was that I tend to work on more than one at once. Again, it's that impulsiveness and that kind of lack of, not care, but lack of kind of focus on one painting that meant that if I do 10 at once, let's say, three of them might be successful. The rest won't be. And that's fine because you've got, still got something from it. You've still got something that works. And I think the more you do at once, the, the more successful you tend to find that at least one of them might be. Um, and it's quite hard to do. You have to be quite uh, sort of uh, strong with how and making sure that the right ones make the grade almost. Um, and that's kind of the, the same sort of practice process that I took into the program. Um, and they were quite interested in that, I think, um, especially the TV cameras. <laughs> you don't realise how different maybe your practice is until someone starts to maybe notice it. Because I think a lot of us generally work in isolation, don't we? Especially when you're not in an art society or anything like that. Um, so it was quite nice to be recognised for that. Uh, some of the judges said some very nice things. Um, and Tyshawn Schoenberg, is, who's, a, who's a British artist, he's quite, quite a big artist uh, in the UK and he was really good. And he gave me lots of tips and chats after, off, off air, which was really cool. And he's a bit of a, bit of a hero of mine. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, so fortunately with this, I, I managed to win that round, the first round. Um, and that was set in Wales, South Wales, where I had to do a sort of, a sort of uh, headland um, off a sort of peninsula, which is completely not what I would normally do. <laughs> but I think the whole point is that you're challenged to do something you wouldn't normally do. And I think that's what's really cool. But if anyone does sort of art competitions or uh, little sort of um, challenges like that, it's, it's taking you out of that comfort zone. And I think that's something I really, in hindsight, really was pleased that I managed to do something, what, something that I still recognise as being my own process and my own practice speaking to people who do it and who did it at the time, they would come and do something completely different that they'd never done before and, and fail miserably. And I never understood that. You know, you have to try and stay 
faithful to your own to what you know and what you believe in and i felt i felt like i tried to do that um so after the first round i i went into the semi-final which was um some lavender fields again something that i wouldn't normally pick to do but fortunately i managed to make it work because um I, I would show you the image but i don't have it anymore um and it, a lot of it was focused on perspective which is great and um lots of different elements of shapes and structure uh, and light. So all of those things came together and, and I, I managed to get through that one and, and that, that put me in the final, um, which I did a painting that I was not happy with whatsoever. There was lots of green and water and trees. Um, but fortunately for me, I, I, I won and uh, that really did change a lot of things. I think when you're, when you're on a sort of something that's, it's funny because I never watched the TV program before. I'm not a massive watcher of reality TV, if you can call it that. Um, I like watching art programs, but I wouldn't ever watch something like that. So for me, I didn't realise how big a following it had. And, and that really did change a lot of things for me. Um, I mean, it was quite nice to get a bit of money for it, which was great, which I've kind of tried to put towards my practice and, and being an artist. Um, but also um, it gave me lots of exposure on social media, which I never even comp comprehended happening. Um, but also it gave me exposure in terms of the art world as well and, and a bit of recognition, which you wouldn't always think would be the case with just a TV programme, but it, it really did. And I had to be quite careful because at this point I, I actually started my first teaching job, uh, but the school were really good because part of it was because they got to be on TV <laughs> and my head of department was interviewed, which she was very happy with. Um, my mum was interviewed, which was painful, um, but it, it worked out really well. And in hindsight, it was a really good, fun, fun thing to do. Um, and if anything ever comes up like that in the US, or even if, I don't know if it's open to US people in the UK, but you should definitely apply to do it because it's really good. Um, even if you don't go through, it's just a really good experience and it's really fun. Um, and after winning it, I, I, I got sent to Jamaica, which was amazing, uh, to paint to uh, Noel Coward's house, um, who's a playwright. And I did lots of really cool little painting studies that they were quite keen to show on camera. Um, but the painting I did in the end, I wasn't particularly happy with, but sometimes you kind of have to do what you have to do. Um, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it was a great experience and something that kind of really set, set me up for what I tried to do afterwards. And, and I thought going back to school afterwards and being, being a teacher again and sort of going into back into normal work, the normal life, I, I realised how much I wanted to try and be an artist and try and not let this opportunity slip. Um, and for me, I was really kind of keen to try and make the most of it. Oops, excuse me. Uh, so what I tried to do was I, I quit my job, which they were really upset about. And I, had, I thought I was doing the completely wrong thing. And what am I doing? This is stupid. Why do I think I can be an artist, you know, when, when so many people fail? And, um, but I was really lucky because as soon as I won, everything on my website sold straight away. People were emailing me from all over the place, asking me to come and do talks and, um, and workshops and just to show my work at here or there, which was amazing. And it's something that you, you think in hindsight, wow, that actually happened. Um, and so I was trying to think, well, how can I make the most of this? Um, and what I love to do and what my work's about is about place and travel and, and moving from one place to another. And I thought, how can I do this? How can I make the most of this opportunity and include those things into it? Um, so what I tried to do was try to sort of use social media and use this really lucky position I was in to try and make contact with some people or, or chase people up that had contacted me. And I started sort of trying to piece together where I could maybe do some workshops and show work and do talks. Um, and also where I could maybe do some artist residences, which I don't know if anyone's ever done any of those, but they're really worth doing if you enjoy travel and living in some, a new place. Um, they're really cool to do. So I thought, right, well, some people have offered me to do those. I'll try and do that. Uh, and obviously being an English speaker and uh, the programme being aired in English speaking countries, I could sort of join the dots of it a little bit, whilst also actually conveniently seeing some members of family and friends that had moved around the world. So I kind of tried, I thought, what the hell, I'll do it. And I'm lucky that my girlfriend now, wife, um, she's a teacher, she's a primary school teacher. So she took the plunge with me and we sort of booked our tickets and went. And, uh, and that's what, when we kind of, I built this body of work that I'm working through now, um, all of with, with, which were taken from th thousands of drawings that I've done from different places around the world. Um, I started off going through Canada uh, to where I did a talk in Toronto and then I did another one in Vancouver on, and then in Victoria Island, uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island. 
uh, I went down through Seattle in the west coast of San Francisco, which is someplace I had to go um, just to see Deben Khan's work and to see what his inspiration was. And I could have spent years there. <laughs> I've, I've still got, I'm still going through loads of drawings I did now. Um, it wasn't enough time, but I don't think it ever is. Um, but that was an amazing experience. And I, we, we carried on to New Zealand, Australia, where I did a few residences, talks, and, and over about a year or so, that's what I did. Um, and I, whilst I was doing that, I was teaching throughout, I was doing workshops and I formed a lots, lots of really cool relationships and really fruitful relationships with galleries and other artists. And that was one of the big things. I, I worked in a, a, in a place in Auckland in New Zealand, an artist, a communal artist space. So getting to see how living next door to literally living, he was living in his studio to like a really well-known uh, ceramicist. Uh, and then a sculptor with that was down the other studio and another painter. And it was really cool kind of having these experiences. And I had to pinch myself thinking, am, am I an artist now? Is this, is this how I kind of, is this what my life's becoming? And I thought this is, if it is, then I'm going to make the most of it. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, how can I keep going? Because I, I generally thought that this would just peter out. And I kind of thought that I, how will I kind of try and keep, make the most of it and make it a kind of, um, thing that I wasn't relying on this some, something that happened ages ago on a TV show. I didn't want to be that kind of artist. I didn't want to be known for one thing. I want, wanted my art to speak for itself. So I was quite keen to try and employ new techniques and new ideas. Um, and I kind of learned a lot of those sorts of things from meeting artists on the, on the way. Um, and my, I've, it's interesting now seeing how my work's changed from when I started the trip to when I finished it and how there's lots of different things I can see in there. Um, and so I was really lucky that I managed to do all of that. And then I was even luckier again when I came back to the UK and um, I was contacted by um, an independent school. I, I think they're called public schools in the US. Um, quite a prestigious school near, not far from where I'm, my hometown is, uh, which I'd not returned to in a long time. And, and, they, and they asked me to um, apply for a position as an artist in residence. Um, and with that role, I get to teach half of the week and I get given a studio uh, where I get to make my own work and you're encouraged to make your own work because you're a practitioner and that's what you do and and that was really good and my boss is another artist and we talk about art all the time and he comes and gives me te te tips and techniques and so that's kind of where I'm at now and um, and obviously after that after sort of returning from to the UK it was it was the summer of 2019 and we all know what happened later on in that year into the into 2020 with when Covid hit um, but I think it's in a very, very sort of funny way. Like, I feel like that was a really good time for some artists to maybe focus on making work. Um, it was a sad time for many of us, I can, uh, of course, as well. Um, but one thing that I really tried, one thing that in hindsight I really noticed was how the artist communities came together on social media in particular. Um, and there was lots of really good initiatives to, that went ahead. And I took part in loads of different schemes, on uh, exhibitions and exchanges where you would, sell work and exchange work with other artists and that was a really nice experience to have and I don't think I feel as, as alone now as an artist as maybe you would have done five five or so years ago um, and a lot of, and through social media I've managed to do lots of virtual workshops and virtual talks like this um, uh, lots of online sales and commissions and, and galleries being in contact so it's and and then a great example of that is is getting in contact with me and, and being able to do this talk to you today so I think if anyone's not on social media, and I know it gets a bad reputation sometimes, but it's, it's a great way to meet other artists and to, to be able to share ideas like this because we often live in our own little world and I think it's really good that we can do this. Um, I mean, my hometown, it's such a little black hole for art that, that it's really hard to kind of do stuff like this in person. So to be able to do stuff like this online and to you live in America is amazing. Um, so that's where I'm at now. Um, I'm really looking forward to coming to the US in the summer. Uh, and I hope to make a whole new body of work from my experience there. Um, and, um, and yeah, so that's essentially where I'm at. Um, and what I'll do now is I think I'll give you a bit of a tour about my space and where I'm working and what I'm working on. Um, so if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, please do. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll wait till the end. So um, I'll just talk along. And then if you have any questions, please do ask. So um, I'm going to flip the camera. Where are we? I'm going to ask this you is a quick a... question, Tom. Yeah, go for it. It's me. It's me. Hello. Um, Hello. Of, all, of all the paintings you did uh, during Landscape Artist of the Year, did you have a favourite? 
Um, yes, it was the Lavender Fields one. <laughs> yeah, it's it was because it, 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 it contained so many of the elements, like mm-hmm. I mentioned, it just contained so many of the elements of the mm-hmm. things that I really like. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas the other ones, it was it was a lot more forced, I should say. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah, but it's it's hard. It's I think because you're kind of dealing with um, stuff that you wouldn't necessarily choose, and, and again, that's the challenge of it all. Um, you're kind of very tied into what you fit you, what you're having to do at that moment in time. So it's a great it's a great experience. And I know, May, you've said that you've done a few um, similar things in the US. So you probably yes. know a similar it's a similar thing, isn't it? Where not necessarily you're, you're not always given the situation that you would choose to you to depict. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. uh we we call them plein air events here yes um, yeah yeah but we we yeah. tend to have the opportunity to choose what we want to do so that's a little bit different right. but thank yeah. you <laughs> okay so um so this is this is my uh sort of table top that i work on you can see the um the sort of sketches that i work through and i will always have these kind of nearby and i would work sort of in this sort of space here and I've got my board, uh, board ready for, for a new painting. You can probably see that it's MDF, um, it's quite thin, it's quite light um, and I sand it and smooth it down so it's a really smooth surface. Um, I, I love it being really nice and smooth because the, the brushes just kind of glide off of it you know um, and, uh, and that's been sanded four times and it's been primed uh, with um, gesso and with a sort of, uh, of diluted Naples yellow. And that's the sort of ground that I work on. And you can kind of see all of these here. Uh, these are ones that are in progress. So these are ones that have had their kind of, I've kind of have had these next to my sketches and I've kind of worked on them as drawings and so, sort of done the first sort of layer, let's say, um, in this kind of uh, red uh, oil paint. And that's been diluted um, with a bit of liquid um, and just... Um, a bit of not turpentine but um, what's called um, Zestit which um, is kind of a diluted brush clean it's like an eco-friendly it smells very nice it smells of like lemon zest it's just an eco-friendly version instead of using turpentine um, and that's how I use it so I, I work it very thinly and work on this surface here I've got my sort of painting wedges that I'll sort of mask areas and move paint around um, and you, as you can see the paintings are very kind of impromptu and kind of um, sort of sketchy in their effect um, and I, I'll work on so this is like a batch that I did the other day um, and at the moment you've got what six going on here so um, I might start the first stage of another set of six works and then I'll work on another uh, another colour over the top of these and in fact you can kind of see these one these two here are a bit further along uh, these are taken from sketches in San Francisco actually um, so this one here, you can kind of see I've kind of put a few more layers into these uh, with blues and the, some dark greens, but there's a lot to do still. Um, but you can kind of see I'm still trying to keep them very, a very um, sort of free flowing and um, not too uh, not too fixed in their marks. I don't want them to be too kind of um, too de- details the wrong word, but too kind of uh, fixed in their kind of ways, if that makes any sense. Uh, but yeah, so this is my studio space. You've got the kind of working area there, which I tend to work on. The issue I have is when I work bigger, which isn't very often, but I've started to do it lately. Um, and I try and figure ways around that. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, now I've got my Hopper book here, which I was going to show you. Uh, that's a really good example to me, or two good examples of Hopper's work and how you've got no uh, the void of people. Um, and they're very abstract in their approach, even though I think you would hate them to be called abstract paintings. Um, but that's, that's that these are what I was sort of very obsessed with um, at one point. Um, a few more examples there of paintings. Um, so this is the rest of my studio, which you can see is nice and tidy. Um, if you've got a few sort of uh, ink studies up there, which I was just experimenting with compositions with, um, you've got a, an example of a bit of life drawing. Um, that's a very big example there that I, I work on. I don't usually work on that sort of scale. Um, but more examples here. I try and um, sort of work on different surfaces sometimes. So I've tried to experiment with bits on uh, certain types of paper. Um, and you've got kind of sort of unfinished interiors and bits and pieces there of experimental things that I've done. Um, and this is a kind of, this is uh, my neighbor's studio and she left and uh, I've inherited the space, which is 
amazing, really. <laughs> and I use this as a kind of uh, study uh, space to sort of build, uh, make boards and, and prime boards and things. But, but lately, as I mentioned, I've tried to go bigger. And this is an example of one of the bigger pieces that I'm working on lately, uh, which is on canvas, um, which normally I would never do. Um, but the gallery I'm working with are quite keen for me to do some bigger pieces. So I'm kind of doing it as a kind of experiment to see if I can do it and if I'm happy with it, but also to try and keep them happy, I guess, which isn't always the right thing to do. I know I, I, I don't want to sort of sell out and do that, but I'm, I'm trying to sort of find ways around it. Uh, but what I'm trying to do and what I've discovered seems to work is that I get this canvas here and I, I uh, put it on the wall, as you can see. And I sort of make, uh, I sand it and then prime it in the same way as I would a board. And I work on sort of on, on, a, on the wall like so. Um, and I've got a few sort of ready there. This is a canvas that I've sort of finished as well. Um, and then I've got this little trolley that I carry around. I move around for me. Uh, but I'll always have sort of a small painting study there, like this one you can see here, um, next to me when I work on a bigger piece. Um, so these studies here, these studies here are, a small studies uh, with the intention of going bigger. So I might use one like this and uh, pop it on here and try and um, use that to help me on this sort of scale. Um, again, it's never that simple though. I, I don't know if any of you guys work uh, a larger scale, but for me, it's, it's very hard. Um, I have to have bigger brushes. I have to scale my marks up, my movement, uh, my materials. Um, it's, it's all very difficult. Um, it's something I'm trying to do and to, to sort of learn how to do properly because I, I just feel that bigger ones just lack that kind of energy and spontaneous spontaneity that I get with smaller pieces. Um, I feel like these ones are a lot more interesting, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, but I'm just again, you, you try to learn, don't you? As an artist, you try and discover new ways of doing things. Um, some of the studies here. Tom, a quick um, question about um, working on site. I know that that was, you know, the premise of Landscape Artist of the Year. Yes. But yeah. um, like, obviously you have a lot of San Francisco ones and I've, I've seen that you had some Ukraine ones and other European ones. So do yeah. you sometimes um, work, you know, like you've not been to a place, but you will work from um, the photographs or something yeah so I, I will all i will always base them on sketches um i would never i would try and avoid, well, i've never really kind of been one to kind of go on google and find a picture of a place and just paint it um for me it's making sure i've got the drawings in place first and that's why it's been so hard lately with covid to not be able to go anywhere because i i the drawings for me are the very basis the, the foundation to all of the paintings um, and because I've got so many sketchbooks um, full of them that I can, uh, one of the, one of the, my favorite pastimes is just to go through sketchbooks and, and try and find a composition that works well that I've not done anything with. And, and that's what is really exciting. Or if there's something that's a, a part finished composition, I'll take that and develop it further. And that's why I, I'm quite insistent that my paintings aren't a literal copy of a place. They're my interpretation and they might be a fusion of three or four drawings. Um, which is difficult when someone expects a painting of a place that looks like a certain thing and you kind of depict it in a slightly more different way. But as far as I'm concerned, if, if you want that to be photorealistic, you know, take a photograph of it or get a photorealistic art, photorealist artist in to do it. Um, I, I, feel, I feel like the, the enjoyment for me comes from the painting itself. It should be a painting first and then a, a thing, a, a, an image of a place second. Um, and that's always something I kind of believe in, really. Um, um, and it tends, it, it seems to have worked out for me. I think, I think people understand that um, because it, it, I, like, I like it to be a painting and, and that's what it should always be. It's, it's a piece of art at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, so what I would always do is I would, I would just refer to sketchbooks and then I would make painting studies from them. Um, like I mentioned, stuff like these here, um, for example, these, these initial early studies, they may well not make it any further than those. It might well may well be that this one in particular, for example, I think, no, it's not working. I'll, I'll just paint over it and do it again. Or So it may well be that none of these make it, or maybe one of them to, ends up being a painting that's refined to the same, same standard as these ones. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of, it's, 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 it is quite a time consuming thing. I think one of the hard things I always find is when people say to me, how long does it take to make a painting? 
Um, because one, for example, one like this, um, I couldn't tell you how long it took because I might have started that stage on a Tuesday one week and then not come back to it for another week. And, and then I might have left it for a few, a few days and done something else and, or, or come back to it having let it go. Or, you know, it's, it's quite a difficult question to answer. <laughs> um, what I'll do now is, um, if any, and anyone, unless, unless anyone's got any questions in the studio, I can always come back. Um, I, I was going to show you downstairs. Go on, please, please ask. Um, at the beginning of uh, earlier, you said you were getting a little sick of landscapes and you were starting to do some other interiors or still lifes or things. Do you have any examples of those? Yeah, so I'll show you downstairs, actually. Um, I, it's, it's not so much like I get sick of sort of landscapes and interiors. I just think sometimes it's nice to do a variety of different subjects. Um, especially like I said, when you're kind of in the studio or if you're kind of going through sketchbooks and you see sort of things that, um, I don't know, I just think it's nice to have a variety of subject matter sometimes if you can. And that's what's really, I really like about still life is that um, with still life, um, I can kind of really uh, play around with compositions and things. Um, so what we're doing now is we're going downstairs um, to the gallery space, which I'll show you. So the school's really lucky in that they've got this wonderful gallery space, which often plays host to artist exhibitions. Uh, we had a Welsh artist in last week, uh, an artist from Poland a week before, a few weeks before that. Um, so my exhibition is going to be up here until June. Um, and you hopefully you get an idea of the scale of the, bit of the, of the room. My studio is just up there. Um, and this is where my exhibition will be. So you can kind of, you get a good idea of the scale of my work when it's, it looks so small compared to some of the walls. <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of interiors and things, I mean, this is an example of an interior. Um, and you've got uh, obviously normal landscapes here. Um, they're very much in the process of, of, of me sort of planning how to put the thing up. Um, it's, as, as I'm sure as many of you know, when you have an exhibition, it's quite hard to sort of know how things work and, and where things go together. So I'm trying to do it so that it's, in, it's going to be in a journey from essentially my studio, which is here, all the way around to across the world to the US and, and, and beyond. Um, so that's, that's my hope for how the exhibition will look. Um, but these are some examples of interiors here. Um, and uh, studio interiors in particular have always interested me. Um, Diebenkorn did lots of them and I was really interested in how he sort of composed them together. And I think, I think just suggestions of stools and chairs are quite interesting. They always are very much suggestive of the human figure almost or of, of a figure being in the room. Um, I, I don't think my work's that sort of deep, <laughs> but um, people have made observations of it before and, you know, why not? <laughs> Yeah. So you've got a couple of still life examples here. Um, I mean, this this one in particular, actually, this is um, this is this room. Um, you can kind of see where I did the drawing from. Um, this was in this was in the middle of lockdown that I did this one because um, I was on my own and there was a mannequin in the window and I was quite interested in just doing a little drawing study of it and I thought I'd do a painting of it. So. That's the resulting one, but that's there's there's actually two of them. That's the um, that's the other one there. Um, but there was there was probably another four or five compositions that I started. But again, like I said, because the way I work, um, these were the only two that were finished. So you've got kind of um, a few more interiors there. This is um, this is an actual study of outside of this building. Um, Again, I really like the light and the perspective um, in that one. This is another one I did in lockdown. Um, it's actually a reference to an Edward Hopper painting, this one. You've got a few more studies of, of the local area that I live in that I did over lockdown. A lot of these were done in lockdown because I couldn't really go anywhere. Um, and some winter studies, um, which are quite different from what I normally do, especially when I'm quite interested in kind of strong, powerful light and and warm, warm colours. This was quite a challenge for me, but I, I wanted to see if I could do it. Um, I've not decided if these are necessarily going to go into the exhibition yet. I've kind of just laid them out just to see what would happen and how they flow together. <laughs> um, 
this is actually one from Landscape Artists of the Year. It's one of the few ones I've actually got left. Um, we One of the commission pieces I had to do was go to Scotland and do a painting of a castle. Um, again, there was no good light in that picture at all. So it's quite a challenge, but there's something I quite like about it. It's quite atmospheric, I think. And then you, you're going to sort of studies now for, from Canada. And this is going into Vancouver, this study here. And then you've got central BC there. And then this is a, a biggest painting that I'm not quite sure if I'm going to put it in. Um, I'm not sure if I'm happy with it or not. And then you've got one of the studies of Seattle. And obviously this one's San Francisco. Um, but again, they're very much sort of, they're sort of popped, popped uh, sort of against the wall just for me to sort of think about and to work out what works and what doesn't. Um, and then you've got some smaller studies here. Uh, that one's taken from inside the De Young Museum in San Francisco. Um, but these are very much my, I, I, I would say that I prefer to do studies at this scale. Um, there's just something about them that I really enjoy doing. In fact, this one here, uh, this is a small study for the bigger one here. Um, which you can kind of see. But um, this, there's something so much more interesting to the little one for me. <laughs> this, I, I can never seem to scale up to the same sort of extent of keeping that, retaining all of those marks and that, that bit of energy. I don't know why. Um, but it's something I'm trying to learn how to do and explore a little bit in my work. Um, you've got a few more studies here. And then another bigger piece here. So yeah, so that gives you a kind of idea of of kind of. Well, this is a little one. I'll show you the little one. This is um this is one I did in uh, in Fiji, which was a, just a stopover from um, San Francisco to uh, New Zealand when we went, which was a really cool little place. And I managed to do a, a very few very few drawings, but the ones I did do, I'm quite happy with. This is the only one I've got left. Unfortunately, I've sold the rest of them, but um, that was quite a nice one. I didn't want to let that one go. Um, there's another uh, sort of studio interior, very much influenced by the one you probably saw earlier. Um, this was a workshop I did at a place called Bethel's Beach, which is uh, in New Zealand. And I did this workshop in this lovely um, sort of house that overlooked this sea and uh, some trees. So yeah, so that gives you a bit of an idea of um, of kind of my studio, my gallery, and the gallery space that I've, I'm fortunate enough to be working in. Um, I'll go up to the studio now, and um, if anyone does have any questions, please do ask. Um, I'll hopefully I've answered a few of them. Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, please do ask. I have another question. <laughs> so your sketches are all in. Uh pencil black and white and obviously your paintings are really colorful how do you decide yeah. how do you how do you translate your your pencil yeah that's a into that's a really good that's a really good question and in fact i'll show you um try and find some old sketchbooks i um when i a lot of the time i carry a little small watercolor set um i'll see if i can find one um sorry um a watercolor set with me um, I mean, this is quite a good example here. So this is actually from Landscape Art of the Year. This is the sketchbook I used. Um, and I'm kind of trying to depict areas of colour, which you can make notes of. Um, you can make notes of what the colour looks like, but sometimes it's great to try and find that and mix it into, into your page. Um, if there's any more of those. But that's a kind of a bit of an example of what I would do. Um, I do have some color studies somewhere, um, but yeah, so yeah, you're right in that I would, I normally do work in pencil, but in reference to color studies, I would do small watercolor studies um, as well as the sketches, should I have time? Um, because I'm sure some of you know, when you're working on a location, you're working quite quickly and, and against the clock. So, but if I do have time, I would certainly get, get watercolors out and do some studies. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Donna here. 
Uh, I noticed that you uh, don't frame your pieces. How do you yeah. display them then? Yeah, good question. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I was talking to May about this the other day, actually. Um, there's something about how they kind of have these nice edges that I quite like them being sort of seen. Um, although saying that, when I do get my work framed, it does look really good uh, in a sort of float mount. Um, it's, it's really down to sort of how people want to, to, to sort of view the work, really. Um, uh, what I do tend to do is when I hang them as they are, is that I get these, um, they're called disc, um, where are they? I've got a box full of them, but I can't find them now. They're, they're sort of circular disc hangers, and uh, you essentially, they've got a kind of dried glue on them, and you wet them, and then you just stick them to the back of the board. Because it's MDF board and it's quite light, you can just hang them, and they have different sizes, but depending on the, on the, on the weight of the board. Um, I can't seem to find one. And I think I've got one in here. Um, and they're really good because they, they're just basically, instead of having to drill into the board itself, you can just stick them on with glue. Uh, this is an example of one here. So they're called a disc hanger. Um, and it says on there that you can do it to a certain, it says it's got a certain size on there, but on the packet it will also have a weight. And that will advise you on how heavy um, you should hang, you should stick this on the back of a board to. Um, but uh, because, like I said, a lot of my work's quite small and it's on board, they don't tend to be that heavy. Um, the problem is when you go bigger, uh, the board gets heavier. Um, and what I tend to do then, for example, of it here, is I do tend to uh, perhaps, well, this is what a gallery has actually done, um, which I wasn't particularly happy with. They tend to screw it into the back. Um, obviously, you have to be very careful because you can see the actual width of the, uh, which of the width of the wood isn't very thick. So if they weren't much kept very careful, it would have come to the other side. Um, but more often than not, I would tend to use these sort of disc hangers that you can just use. You can get these on Amazon. Um, I'm pretty sure they'll be available in the US. Um, but I've got a whole box of them. Um, oh, they're here. Um, and they kind of come in boxes like this. And that's a, that's a good example of one. That can hold a weight to... Um, says two kilograms so that's what i would would normally use um if the if the boards were going up naked almost without a frame um but they do look really good framed i, I work with a framer uh, who, who works in the local area and she's really good um she float maps them and they look amazing when they're done um but it's one of those things where i wouldn't necessarily choose to do it myself um, but a lot of people who buy my work and, and sort of galleries and things do like them framed. Um, and the one thing I would refuse, to, not refuse, but put up a bit of an argument against would be if someone decides to have a really elaborate, big, chunky frame that's really detailed and beautiful in its own right, but not really appropriate for the paintings that I work with. So, yeah. So hopefully that's answered your question, but it's a really good question. Has anyone else got a question? I don't think so. I guess, <clears throat> are there any other questions for Tom? Okay, well, um, Thank you very much, Tom. That was that was really great. <laughs> I appreciate you giving the the background first and then seeing those pieces. I love. I had no idea that you worked all those small pieces up, but I, I thought that was really really cool to see. And I love oh, that. Thank you. Well, if any if anyone does have any more questions, please yeah. do email me, um, yeah. and hopefully I'll get to meet lots of you in a few months' time, um, and I'll bring some work over. And I'll I'm, I was I'm in talk with. With May about actually posting some work over, so um, hopefully you'll get to see it in the flesh. We'll, we'll look forward to see what you uh, create when you visit our fine yes. city. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't wait. Uh, I'm Absolutely. thinking the art museum could end up being a pretty cool piece, but anyways, um, <laughs> if if there's nothing else, uh, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate we're able to do this. Technical difficulties last week. 
you know, that we, we never tried this before uh, on this scale. So we appreciate your patience and being able to join us, making the extra time to come back and join us today. So with that, um, I wish everyone, uh, however you celebrate Easter, a uh, good holiday weekend here and um, enjoy the rest of the day. I know for you, probably headed off to dinner somewhere, maybe the pub again, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not the pub today. Well, actually, actually, what's okay. the time? No, not, not, not yet. It's a bit early yet. Um, it's Is a really it nice day, so I'm prob probably going to go and um, I might try and do a little bit of drawing, actually. A little sketchy. Um, Excellent. Outside, so, yeah. Well, you, you've inspired all of us to, uh, with, with what you showed us today. Again, thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. So wonderful to meet you all. And uh, I look forward to seeing you actually in person at some point soon. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Tom. you.